Hello again, I'm Braddock Supervisor John Cook. Welcome back to Braddock Neighborhood News, the program I am using to provide you with information on issues facing our community and ideas on how we can strengthen our neighborhoods. This month, I'm honored to have Deputy County Executive and past Fairfax County Chief of Police, Dave Rohr, on the show with us. Chief Rohr began his career with the county in 1980 as a police officer and has worked his way up to the position he holds today. With a man such as Chief Rohr overseeing our public safety and emergency management, we are all in good hands. Chief Rohr, thanks so much for being on the show with us today. Well, thank you for having me. Well, let's talk a little bit about your career. You've been with the county for a long time. And when you talk about working your way up through the ranks, you know, you're a great example of that. So tell us a little bit about your career with the county. Well, first, I've been, I've been humbled and honored and privileged to be a, first a Fairfax County police officer. I was sworn in December 1st, 1980. Uh, um, I was in high school then, so you know. That's <laughs> well, well, many many of the new police officers <laughs> weren't even born yet. So, uh, but certainly for me, it was almost 32 years uh, service to Fairfax County as a police officer. Uh, I had a great opportunity to work my way up, you know, through various ranks. I was a police officer on the street. I was a detective briefly. I was on the SWAT team uh, for seven years in different ranks. I had a chance to um, run two district stations as a captain. I worked as a duty officer, working nights, a job that I also loved. Uh, deputy Chief of Police, and then I was honored to be named Chief of Police uh, July 12th of 2004. So I served as Chief for almost eight years, and uh, I was just humbled to do that. A great job, a great community, a great department, uh, great men and women who are dedicated and professional and do a wonderful job. I wish our community really knew each of those men and women better. Uh, they really are talented, dedicated people. And I always say I was blessed, and we're blessed to serve such a wonderful and caring and supportive community. So I, I was honored to serve and I appreciate this new opportunity that I have now as Deputy County Executive. Right, and uh, our County Executive, Ed Long, named you as uh, Deputy County Executive just, I was gonna say a few months ago, but I guess sometime the end of last year. And we're all thrilled to have you in the position. And uh, you oversee uh, a few of our different departments. Tell us about the current job. Yeah, I really have. I was named actually October 20th, uh, so last fall. Uh, I have a pretty much the entire public safety spectrum. So I still oversee the police department. I oversee fire and rescue. I oversee now the independent agencies of Office of Emergency Management and Department of Public Safety Communications, our dispatch center. I uh, also liaison with the sheriff's office. Uh, a little unique, it's a uh, you know, elected official, the sheriff is, but uh, he's, he's a great uh, collaborator, uh, great cooperation with Fairfax County. So I work with him, I liaison with him in public safety as well. That's, you know, um, you've held a number of different jobs, certainly with the police department. Um, which was your favorite? Uh, you know, people can look back on their career, and sometimes it's an early job, sometimes mm -hmm. a later job. You certainly have run the gamut. What, what was the most exciting time and the most interesting time? You know, I think it's hard in some ways to pin down. We've all had many different levels, and we've enjoyed all of those. But from any police officer, I think, would tell you that that first position, you know, being a police officer on the street, you know, having the cruiser, being out on your own, your own boss, so to speak, doing what you love to do, want to do, public service. That's my passion. That was my calling uh, to be out on the street again, so to speak, and working areas and talking to residents, you know, solving crimes, keeping the community safe. My first love was always that patrol officer position. I mentioned earlier uh, the SWAT team. I had a chance to compete and was selected for the SWAT team after about five years on the department. I spent seven years, you know, doing SWAT actually at different levels as an officer, a supervisor, and later commander. So that really was probably the most formative time of my career where I really learned a lot, had a chance to do high-risk operations, high-risk planning, and learned a lot about leadership and working with very good officers, all hand-picked, all volunteers. Uh, beyond that, you know, being a station commander, one of the great assignments, uh, working in McLean and Fair Oaks uh, districts as a captain, and then duty officer I mentioned before, and then certainly as chief of police. Uh, what an honor. Uh, very, again, very humbling. Um, to me, it was about leadership. It was also about being a steward. Uh, the, a department that was built by some great men and women, a great community, and looking at the change that we, uh, we've dealt with and, 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 and the progress we've made uh, to be chief of a, a department as progressive as Fairfax County was a great honor for me. And I was so blessed with, again, the men and women that worked, I worked with, whether they're sworn, civilian, or volunteer. And again, uh, as you well know, uh, we are so well served by such an engaged community. And, you know, we really, um, we have great community and police collaboration in the county. 
We've got a great department. Um, we don't have uh, a lot of those problems that we read about in other places with police and police community issues. Wh why is that? What is it about Fairfax County that maybe makes our county different or our police different? A cut above if we can be a little bragging about that, but we seem to be. I think it's good to brag. You know, I, I never say the word the best, but we're certainly one of the best, I think, nationwide, certainly in this region. And, and it's multifaceted. You know, I'll go back to certainly the bragging rights, the bias, a great department, great men and women, uh, dedicated, talented, professional, want to do the right thing, a lot of integrity, a lot of character. But again, it goes back to the support that we have, elected officials, businesses, you know, the community as a whole. Uh, community policing was really the model we adopted probably almost 20 years ago, and we continue to enhance that. You know, that's about partnership with the community. That, you know, police cannot do it all alone. The more that we engage, the more that we communicate, the more that we you know, share information, the better we're all going to be and the safer we're going to be. So yes, we have an extremely safe uh, community, a very low crime rate. I don't like any crime. You don't like any crime. You know, so we don't tolerate it very well. But when you look at the data, uh, truly, you know, we can say we have one of the lowest crime rates, uh, certainly for a large jurisdiction, a large locality, particularly violent crime. Um, I don't like any homicides, any sexual assaults, but we have an incredibly low crime rate. And again, I think the kudos go to the department, but really to the community who continues to support us, share information and engage and trust us. And that's important. Yeah, and that, that interaction, um, I, I do a lot with our neighborhood watch and, and that kind of thing, and we've got uh, um, great officers who are very active with our communities, and, and that's important. It's important for um, the citizens who are, are volunteering, whether it's neighborhood watch or working with the police and, and, and the officers who are coming out in the community, and there's never been a time that I've been on the board where you know, we've asked if a police officer could come out to a community meeting and been told, nope, sorry, we're too busy. Uh, and and uh, I think people in the communities really not only respect that, but that partnership's important. Oh, absolutely. And again, I just want to, you mentioned Neighborhood Watch. Uh, we've had a program since 1979. We actually have one of the longest, well, the longest running, <coughs> continuous active Neighborhood Watch program in Camelot. Uh, so we really have a, a long history in Neighborhood Watch. Uh, the citizen advisory committees, each of the district stations, as you well know, but for your, your viewers today, if anybody's not engaged at a district station level, we'd love to invite them. Each station has monthly meetings. We invite uh, you know, residents and others to come and listen and engage in dialogue. We all get better by sharing dialogue. So citizens advisory committees are a great way to stay engaged. Volunteerism, you know how volunteers, or we have so many in Fairfax County the police department, volunteers and police service, auxiliary police officers. There's so many ways to stay engaged and share information. So again, we are, we're really blessed by the residents and the businesses in Fairfax. Now, when you uh, became deputy county executive, of course, the portfolio gets bigger. Uh, police department, you obviously know very well. Fire department, another one of our great departments here in Fairfax County, and that came under your purview. What's it like as a police officer getting to know the fire department, obviously you'd worked closely with them throughout your career, but culture is a little different. It's a, it's a different operation, although similar in that you both, you know, both departments are serving the community. Well, I have the, 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 the utmost respect for the men and women in the fire and rescue department as well across all public safety. I think it's probably the other way around. They're more concerned with me a little bit probably. You know, here's, here comes <laughs> the police chief in uh, to kind of take over a new role, but certainly uh, I have great respect for them. I intend to learn more about them. I have worked with them at the line level in many ways for many years. And uh, I, I can truly say that there's a great partnership and a relationship between you know, the men and women in the police department and fire and rescue, emergency management, and, 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 and public safety communications in Fairfax. We work very well together. It's collaboration and partnership. But those two biggies, you know, police and fire, certainly work very well together. So my role right now, my promise to them, to Fire and Rescue, is to get out and learn more, to show my face. I'm doing ride-alongs with battalion chiefs, for example, just to get out and get a better working knowledge of what they do in their operations, their culture, so I can truly, you know, better support them and advocate for them as well, not just, you know, the police department. It's interesting with Fire and Rescue, uh, one of the things I've learned that um, traditionally we thought in terms of a fire department that went out and put out fires and, and with better buildings, less wood, and other things, uh, and better safety 
processes. We have a lot less fires than we used to have. And what fire and rescue does a lot more of is the rescue part, the, the medical part, um, going out, <clears throat> heart attacks and strokes and all those you know, bad things that can happen to people. And, and that's really a, a big part, the biggest part of what that department does and does it very well. Right, it's probably now emergency medical services are probably about 60 or 70 percent of their calls for yeah. service. So they have changed as a profession across the country, not only in Fairfax. Uh, but they still have to maintain the competency and the ability to suppress fires, and they do still have fires in the county and elsewhere. It is greatly reduced, and, and, and very fortunately, fire deaths are down because of prevention activities as well and, and education. But really, uh, we should all be very proud of the ability and, and the capacity that the Fire and Rescue Department brings to do emergency medical services in Fairfax. Uh, they are truly, uh, again, uh, just very dedicated. They train very hard. The paramedics that serve us are, are very strong, and uh, we're very proud of them. And then I guess the third, uh, third department under your purview, uh, the third larger one, emergency management, obviously something that's in the last decade or so become a much more at the forefront of our thinking. And uh, we're still doing a lot uh, here to, to try to get emergency management uh, where we want it, coordination with the community, which never stops. And tell us a little bit about those efforts. Well, I think, they're, again, they're also a very talented group of people. I've had a chance throughout my career with Fairfax to watch that operation evolve. At one time, it was part of the police department. We only had one and then two persons doing that entire mission. And as you just mentioned, over the last decade or so, that has really expanded. So we have a much larger group now doing, you know, in the Office of Emergency Management, you know, doing the planning, the coordination, the training, the responses when we have, you know, critical incidents or crises or severe inclement weather. Uh, so they really do a wonderful job. You know, one of, one of my, my role right now probably is just to continue to learn more uh, about what they really need me to do to help them, uh, to continue to advocate for them. Um, they're... They obviously plan, they train, they respond, they're experts in what they do. They're also coordinators though, and as you kind of mentioned that, uh, certainly many other county agencies have a role during crises or emergencies, police department, health department, fire and rescue departments, you know, zoning, public works, uh, nonprofits, the faith community, businesses, residents, and the list goes you know, on and on and on. So their job is to continue to evolve and how they can best coordinate so as a coordinated community response, you know, we can be strongest in doing that so that we're all safe. Um, certainly one of my roles, one of the challenges quite often, as they're doing their, their subject matter expertise and responding and dealing with the problem is really getting information out to elected officials, to the media, and to residents and businesses. So one of my roles now is to continue to work to, with them, also with the uh, Office, of, Office of Public Affairs under Murray Fitzgerald, to continue to find ways to strengthen that I think we saw during Hurricane Sandy last fall, although we were fortunately you know, spared the brunt of that storm, uh, the fruits of our labor and really pushing out more information in preparation, uh, education in advance of that storm, information to elected officials and communities and the media during the storm. Uh, so I think we have a good platform to build from in the future. But you know, my role is to make sure that they're ready, that they're coordinating, that they're training other agencies, the nonprofits again, uh, working with all of our partners in the region and again, finding new ways to get information out during crises and storms, social media, just the old traditional TV and radio outlets as well. And, and I would think that um, you're helped in that capacity by your own experience. Uh, um, you know, a lot of our emergency management thinking came to the forefront with 9-11 and then the sniper, you know, after that. And of course, <laughs> you were the police department at the time. Tell us about those experiences and how those have helped prepare you to now oversee our emergency management. Function. Yeah, in some ways it's surreal to look back, and it was surreal at the time. Some of those cases very tragic, obviously, but you mentioned, you know, 9-11. So I think back to, you know, 2001, the sniper case of 2002. And, and certainly in this region, we are blessed with a lot of uh, close relationships at the local, state, and federal level. You know, across what we call pretty affectionately the national capital region. So we have Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. So in some ways it's challenging because we have, you know, two states and a, and a city basically trying to coordinate responses, coordinate policy decisions, coordinate funding sometimes. Uh, we also have a very large federal government presence. It also brings a lot of resources to bear, though. So when I think back, you know, to those incidents we just talked about briefly, the experience and what we learned from those is that we have to work very closely together. We can't work in stovepipes. 
you know, offenders, big storms, uh, tragedies, 9-11, they don't know boundaries. So, you know, not only Fairfax is impacted, but so is the Montgomery counties and the PGs and the Arlingtons and the Alexandrias, the Prince Williams. We have to work together. We have resources that we can bring to bear. We can share resources. We can't all have everything. So we have to find ways to to best share expertise and our resources. And, and I, was, I, I want to assure the, the community that at this level, uh, we are really are, again, blessed. There is a great partnership and relationship among the localities across this region. You know, we, I mentioned 9-11 a little bit, and uh, everybody remembers where they were that day. And tell us about your experience. You were a little closer to uh, what was going on, obviously, as a police officer than, than some others. And, and just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, as, as you just said, we all remember. Anybody uh, was, you know, probably five years older, older in 2001. And I mentioned this before and other times that I've spoken. You know, those of the greatest generation, so to speak, remember where they were on Pearl Harbor. You know, I'm a boomer, so I can remember where I was when JFK was assassinated, when the Challenger exploded, when the first men landed on the moon. So yes, 9-11, it, it was a beautiful blue sky morning. Uh, I was actually, I was out for a run, actually. I was doing my wellness. I was out for exercise, doing a jog. When I got the first page, I got back to uh, uh, in front of a TV, and I actually saw live the second plane hit uh, the World Trade Center. So, yes, I mean, obviously, uh, we all went through. I don't care if you're a public safety, whether you're a firefighter or a police officer. You know, the impact was the same on all of us in so many ways. So the shared emotions, you know, the, the shock, the denial, the grief. But um, again, I was so proud of what public safety did, you know, here at the Pentagon in our region, uh, certainly in New York City and Pennsylvania. But again, it was also about just everyday citizen heroes. The community responded. And we should all be so proud of how we pulled together. Again, a very tragic time. But the community and public safety pulled together. And um, my only concern really going forward is that I worry that we've forgotten a little bit. We have to continue to be vigilant. You know, as a community, so preparation is still key. Training is still key. You know, not only for government, so to speak, but let's go back to that, you know, residents and businesses have a responsibility to always be prepared as well. So we ask them to not lose sight of whatever the threat may be, whether it be a 9-11 or whether it be just inclement weather sometimes, an earthquake, tornadoes, always be prepared. You know, know where um, you can find information, obviously on county websites, you know, have have water, have a radio, all those things they need to do. But again, as I think back, it's just a matter of collaboration and working together and sharing, uh, again, some great resources and great talent. You know, you mentioned the, the community piece, and, and that's one of you know, my sort of big issues as a supervisor, but really believe that in making our community stronger, uh, and part of that is, is each community sort of needs a mini emergency management plan. I mean, we've got a county plan, and of course, we tell individuals and families to be prepared because if, if there is, whether it's a, a military event or, or a weather event like we've had, that you know, you've got to be able to handle yourself for a period of time. But we need neighborhoods to operate together. And, and what, um, one thing I like to do on the show is kind of encourage people how they can volunteer and make their neighborhoods better. And, and there's a role for people to play in that emergency planning on a neighborhood level. Well, absolutely. And again, we talked about, you know, one that's kind of an older traditional one like Neighborhood Watch. It's a great way to stay connected and not only be prepared, but also to me, it's always about building neighborhoods, too. But certainly, you know, Fire and Rescue has a great program, the CERT program, right. and the Community Emergency Response Teams. It's a great way to reach out and get more training for a neighborhood, for a business, which they've also done many times uh, through the Fire and Rescue Department. Uh, the Health Department has the Medical Reserve Corps. There are so many ways that, that the residents of Fairfax, the communities, the neighborhoods can help us and help themselves. Again, in that first two or three days in particular sometimes, you know, as we, as we work our way out of chaos sometimes or emergencies or crises, the more that they're self-reliant, the more they're prepared, uh, the better off we're all going to be. But there are so many outlets for that. And again, information is on county websites. And so I encourage you know, residents and businesses to reach out. Yeah, and to, uh, to be in a position to help your neighbors, you know, as you said, we, we, we saw it with the snowstorm a few years ago where you couldn't get fire vehicles and ambulances sometimes into cul-de-sacs and, and neighborhoods. And so um, people who can be aware of who their neighbors are and who needs help, and when somebody has an ability, somebody's got a truck that can get you out in the snow, 
find out who needs some help and it's just important for people to kind of be aware of their neighbors and where they live. Yeah, that's a great comment and certainly, um, you know, several generations ago we all knew our neighbors and everybody had block parties and a little bit less today. Of course, some of that's for various reasons, a very transient community too. So you're, you're absolutely right too. The more the neighbors, you know, can go out, you know, clear sidewalks, help clear the streets if they can, just check on their neighbor, especially if it's an elderly person or somebody with special needs, knock on the door, check on them as best they can. It helps us all. So uh, it's a great comment you made. Thank you. Now, one of the um, sort of emergency issues that we've had that that um, hasn't been, hasn't worked out so well is, is the problem we have with the 911 system. And um, obviously we were all very concerned when that went down in the storm. And, uh, but there's been a lot of work done recently on that. Mm -hmm. What can you share with us about where we are in 911? Well, certainly, as you mentioned, uh, in June 29th of last year with the derecho storm that came through that knocked out the 911 center uh, through Verizon, basically. But you know, with the board and, and the chairman's support and the leadership, uh, a lot of work was done. Uh, a lot of committees were called. A lot of studies have been done. A lot of reviews have been done. Uh, I'm fairly confident. Now, there's never a guarantee, but um, I think that the, uh, the vendors and many others, FCC have been involved, many others, have put together you know, a good review, looking at the systems, looking at the equipment, um, you know, the backup generators and other places, all those things. Uh, a lot of steps have been taken, and behind the scenes for the last couple of storms, like Sandy and some others that have, you know, like snowstorms that were threatening the East Coast, you know, this year, um, our DPSC, our, you know, Public Safety Communications Center has reached out to Verizon in particular and had, you know, teleconferences in advance to make sure that everybody is ready. So I'm fairly confident that the steps the board and many others took in this region have been successful and hopefully going forward we'll have uh, no more problems like that. Well, that's good to hear and we appreciate your work on that. And let's, let's maybe go back to neighborhoods a little bit. Um, some of the uh, maybe smaller but uh, very important issues that concern people every day with their neighborhoods and public <laughs> safety, because we are so relatively crime free, but speeding <clears throat> and uh, other driving issues, drunk driving, underage drinking and how that can turn into drunk driving, that's, that's an important thing we need to work on in our communities. Yeah, and certainly you've taken a leadership role on that and reached out to us about doing more enforcement and more education on, on road safety and, and neighborhood driving issues. But, uh, you know, certainly over my 32 years, you know, working the streets, so to speak, it's always frustrating. And I'm sure some will say, well, it's just a chief talking, a police officer talking. They're, they're very rule oriented, but there are speed limits. You know, there are, you know, signs about when you can make a right turn or red, when you can't, uh, safe yields, all these things that we, we teach drivers to do. Um, a big part of it is enforcement, but a bigger part of it is really voluntary compliance. So I, I really do wish uh, that more drivers, I, I know it's, it's a busy time in our lives, the stress, you know, sitting in traffic and you want to get home and see your family so many times, but uh, we really need to, to slow down, obey the speed limits, drive carefully, be careful doing lane changes, all those things. Again, it's a big uh, personal responsibility, not just about enforcement. So what we can do more, um, not only in enforcement, but education, we being the, the police officers on the street. Um, I, I still say we quite often, but they can do a lot more also in education, traffic safety education. We use the radar trailers sometimes out to show motorists their speed. Uh, we've used ghost cruisers, so to speak, in some neighborhoods, just putting an empty cruiser, you know, to get people to slow down when they see that car and hit their brakes to slow down. Right, um, and, and that's important because uh, while sometimes people have the tendency to say that, you know, other people are speeding, what I know I've learned from the police is that people speed in their own neighborhoods, and, and we, right. we all need to take that upon ourselves as citizens to, uh, to slow down because safe neighborhood is not just a crime-free neighborhood, but we don't want accidents. We don't want the neighborhood children hit by a speeding car and that kind of thing. You know, we're going to be out of time soon. I wanted to hit on one other topic because I know it's very important to you. It's important to me, and that's domestic violence. And we don't talk about it enough, and it's a, a major mm -hmm. cause of homelessness in the county. It's a major cause of problems we have with, you know, children who are, you know, not in a stable home. It's one of our major crime sources. What can you tell us about what we need to know? Well, as you just said, we have to continue to talk about it. Uh, in, in Fairfax County, uh, we are fortunately low in many other crimes, but domestic violence is in every community, every neighborhood. Um, and we talk, I, mean, I can think back when we had some gang crime, everybody gets alarmed about that, and rightly so. 
But we have over 2,000 reported domestic violence cases every year in Fairfax County. And, and we also all know we have many more that are unreported. So I appreciate the support of the board. I know you're, you have a role now on the Domestic Violence Prevention Council. Right. I appreciate that. It really is, as one of my friends as an advocate used to say, it's all about a coordinated community response. You know, it's, a, it's across the board in Fairfax. Uh, we have to recognize it's there. We have to take it seriously. We have to put all of our resources to it because no one deserves to be harmed. I don't care if it's a, you know, a spouse, you know, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, you know, son, a daughter, a father, a mother, a child. We, we have to take uh, more steps and recognize that it touches every neighborhood, every demographic in Fairfax County, every culture in Fairfax County. And we, and we could talk a whole lot more about it, but unfortunately we're out of time. I want to thank Chief Four for being on the show today. His experience, knowledge, and commitment to duty are a big reason why Fairfax County will remain a safe and wonderful place to live, work, and play. I hope you've enjoyed this segment of Braddock Neighborhood News. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, comments, or other needs, please contact my office at 703-425-9300 or email me at braddock at fairfaxcounty.gov. Tune in next month for another edition, and please remember to look for ways to volunteer. Your community needs you. Thanks.